Hello and welcome to the ICG 2020's Development Dialogue with Dr. S. Jayashankar, India's Minister of External Affairs. I am Pushkar, Director of the International Center, Goa. Today's discussion with Dr. Jayashankar is organized around his book, The India Way, Strategies for an Uncertain World. But some of the discussion will go beyond the book. I now invite Mr. Yatin Kakotka, President, of the International Center Goa for his introductory remarks and to welcome the speakers. Good evening and welcome to the International Center Goa and to the fourth webinar program of the series 2020's Development Dialogue. The topic today is India's foreign policy, the India way. To discuss some issues of India's foreign policy, we are privileged to have with us Dr. S. Jai Shankar, Minister of External Affairs Government of India and a member of the Rajya Sabha representing Gujarat. He was earlier president of Global Corporate Affairs at Tata Sons Private Limited. A career diplomat, Dr. Jay Shankar served as foreign secretary from 2015 to 2018, ambassador to United States from 2013 to 2015, ambassador to China from 2009 to 2013, high commissioner to Singapore from 2007 to 2009, and ambassador to the Czech Republic 2000 to 2004. He has also served in other diplomatic assignments at Indian embassies in Moscow, Colombo, Budapest, and Tokyo, as well as in the Ministry of External Affairs and the President's Secretariat. His book, The India Way, Strategies for an Uncertain World, was published in 2020. Dr. Jay Shankar was awarded the Padma Shri in 2019. In conversation with Dr. Jay Shankar is Mr. Dattara Salgaonkar. Mr. Salgaonkar is the chairman of the Goa-based VM Salgaonkar Corporation Private Limited with a presence in hospitality, real estate, and private equity. He's passionate about education and the arts, and his foundation runs schools and colleges in Goa. He's a production engineer from VJTI Bombay University and an MBA from Wharton Business School. He's a founder member of ICG, vice president of ICG, and chairs the ICG programs committee. Before we start the session today, I'm pleased to announce that our next webinar program will be held in the second half of April, which is next month, and will feature India's foremost lawyer, Mr. Harish Salve. I now hand over the session to Mr. Salgaonkar, and I hope you find it interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Yatin. Uh, and once again, uh, I warmly welcome uh, Dr. Jai Shankar. Thank you, sir, for giving us uh, the privilege of your precious time, despite an extremely busy schedule. Uh, I shall dive uh, straight in. Uh, to begin with, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar, tell us the story uh, of uh, your starting with your childhood. How did you become in uh, uh, interest in foreign services? And tell us about your journey in becoming uh, uh, the external affairs uh, minister. Well, look, uh, if you want to hear the story of my childhood, I think you have to budget more than one hour. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, seriously, uh, you know. Uh, I, I grew up in a household where foreign relations, uh, uh, politics uh, were, were, very, uh, were very strong themes in everyday life. Uh, my father was in the government, very active in these fields. Uh, and uh, so, so it was something which you, you know, I mean, it's like perhaps you would have learned uh, business that way, uh, that, you know, often, it's just people around you from whom you uh, pick up things, you get into certain habits, your, your dinner time conversations are on those subjects. So it's very unconscious, uh, really. Uh, and uh, I did what I suppose anybody of that era would have done, which is go through school, uh, you know, get into college. I was, my first degree was actually a science degree, uh, except uh, uh, I, I, the librarian used to complain that I used to check out more books on history and politics than on my own subject. Uh, then when I finished that, I actually joined the IIT uh, Delhi uh, for a master's in chemistry. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't think I was incompetent at it, but I'm not sure my heart was really in it. Uh, so I got completely by accident uh, interested in an institution next door, which is called JNU, uh, where uh, fortunately that year, due to famous traditional strikes in JNU, admissions were late. 
Uh, so although I joined IIT, the admissions in JNU were not done. Uh, so I actually left IIT after a few weeks uh, and uh, joined uh, JNU for a master's in uh, political science. Uh, and I was really, I mean, uh, it, it was for me a different world because, and, and this is, this is a sort of a, a free life advice I offer to everybody, which is if you make a profession of what you like, it's very easy. You know, you really enjoy doing, you know, I'd read my, my course books for, for entertainment, I mean, for, for interest. Uh, and uh, so I had, a, you know, I, I suddenly found, uh, frankly, my, it was easier to uh, get good grades and do well because you were interested in what you were doing. Uh, and uh, my initial, uh, you know, I think intention, uh, I mean, uh, look, when you are in your late teens, I, I don't know how much thought you're really given to the future. So you sort of went along, coasted along in life without too much uh, thought about where you're going. I was actually headed out to Australia for a PhD and uh, my, I have an elder brother. He joined the government uh, and uh, he, he sort of, uh, to some extent, I think, uh, influenced the idea that, you know, why don't you also look at sitting for the UPSC exam? I, I wouldn't have really done it had it not been for him. And uh, quite honestly, I can say I even used uh, some of his notes and preparations to, to do that. And I think my father very subtly encouraged it because he was in the government himself. So that's really how I ended up with the, in the foreign service. But after 41 years in the foreign service, I think the transition to being a minister, that was something which was out of the blue. I, I, I you know, it had not even crossed my mind. Uh, I retired and uh, joined uh, the corporate sector. It was always something uh, one part of me was always interested in that. I, I must say I had a great time. I would have, uh, it, it was something, it was for me, like almost starting afresh, you know, something else, something new, you know, uh, great learnings there. Uh, uh, again, you, you're very fired up because it was, it was uh, every day was, was a very novel day. Uh, and uh, then after I'd done about a year of it, uh, the elections happened. That after the elections, uh, uh, the the you know the opportunity uh, came uh, to to enter uh, politics and and uh, become a minister. And you know uh, it was a great privilege. It's and it's it's really I mean uh, for for someone interested in politics with a his you know with a background in in uh, diplomacy and international relations. I mean, I mean what, what more can you ask? Fantastic. Uh, just as a supplementary, could you share with us who uh, uh, in your childhood and later days uh, influenced you and the values you imbibed along the way? Because they reflect a lot in your book, India Way. I mean, you know, and was it your father? Was it your professors? Was it your teacher? Who, who influenced you the most and your values? Uh, well, it's it's hard, you know. You you it's very, you know. Even if you look back on life, you can't say, okay, that person gave me twenty percent, or that person taught me this. I, I think it was a it was a sort of a cumulative uh, cumulative uh, experience. Uh, you know, if, if you are a middle class, salaried family person growing up in nineteen sixties and seventies India, uh, I mean there there, are, there is a kind of a uh, I would say a collective in which you live, you know. Uh, it's a collective of your immediate family, your siblings, your extended family. I mean, uh, to a large extent, my grandparents had a lot of influence. I spent a lot of time with my grandparents. So a lot of my reading habits and so on uh, came, from, came from there. But I would say all said and done, I mean, uh, in terms of what you see in the book, uh, clearly, uh, if there was... Uh, a single person uh, within this this environment, it would be my father, uh, who who was uh, uh, who was a person of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, I I I mean he had he was obviously a very talented person and a person who did a lot with his own life, but who also was a person who was very democratic within the family, encouraged his children to 
to argue with him and you know challenge you in a very very interesting way uh, and of course when i joined service i was lucky that uh, i had uh, mentors and uh, you know seniors who who gave you time and and you know shaped you again there were many of them but the, uh, i picked one uh, for uh, to whom i dedicated the book which is uh, uh, my my in a sense my first boss in the foreign service uh, ambassador arvind dev uh, who who uh, retired as our ambassador in nepal uh, and uh, he he at that time was heading the east european desk uh, I, R- russian was my language when i joined the foreign service so i i spent a lot of time with him so i would say when i look back if you say okay who were your major influences early on they they would be the two which is why the dedication but there would be many others i mean you you look you you live and you learn every day and you meet interesting people and you know almost everybody you work with teaches you something and they don't have to be older and senior to i i would say in all honesty uh, today i would learn probably a lot from people much younger because they know stuff and do stuff which uh which make me look flat footed in comparison thank you uh i'll go to the book now your book and ideas draw quite heavily from our epic mahabharat i personally find the chapter on uh, krishna's choice very fascinating and also after reading your chapter you know i find it the most complex uh, can you tell us what attracted you to the mahabharat and how did you go about processing and interpreting the importance of human behavior in matter of state craft uh you know i again uh, it was something which grew over time uh, uh it it grew over time because uh, i must have first read the mahabharat probably before i was 10 i mean i, I can't put a date to it uh and uh, i first read you know the i read it in english uh you know there's a there was a abridged version of it by raja ji uh, sri rajgopalachari he had both a, a mahabharat and a, and a ramayan uh, which were you know about maybe 150 200 pages uh, very very readable uh, very easy to to understand uh and uh, it wasn't you know uh, my my brothers and sisters also read it so did my cousin so often in fact when we were in our early teens we would even give people code names you know we were talking about other people using names out of uh, the mahabharat uh and as i got into political science and uh, you know uh, international relations i then from being an interesting fable okay from from being an epic from being uh, something which uh, which uh, is a kind of a history uh, you then uh, started looking at it much more in terms of uh, politics and uh, behavior of states uh, but uh, and and you know again with Uh, with the passage of time there were additional layers on it i mean i still remember reading an article by somebody who had plotted the various kingdoms okay uh, in the mahabharat and made out a broad case why kingdoms these kingdoms allied were on this side and those kingdoms were on that side But in many cases there were natural kingdom rivalries you know there was a balance of power there was the neighbor's neighbor uh, so often the you know what was the interest say of uh, dwarka in supporting indraprastha versus uh, hastinapur so which was the hegemonic power which were the powers which were challenging uh, the hegemon so as i would say probably as i grew i kept going back to it uh, with a with a uh, and seeing new things and learning new things uh, out of it. uh and when you actually when i practiced uh, diplomacy uh then you actually you know you understand so many other facets of it you know the importance of being reasonable you know of of putting your case uh, across uh, well 
but most important which which uh, i i make the point uh, in in that chapter of the book uh, at the end of the day you know being good is not just about being good it's also being smart that uh, you know you it, i mean in in the corporate world i would say it's like brand building that if you have you know if you have the reputation developed over time that you are the reasonable person you do the right thing uh, you know uh, there are you follow the norms what we would say today a rules based order then you develop a certain uh, image of yourself and that makes a big difference you know others treat you uh, differently if if you build that that kind of uh, brand so, so so as i said some of it was study familiarity it was interesting it's a great story i mean uh, to me it's one of the you know it's it's, a, it's it's something you can read a thousand times and still keep finding you know new angles to it. you know all the great epics are like that but again uh, the reason i put it in this book was one uh, to me uh, as a rising power today in india it's important for indians to know what they themselves are what is their heritage what is their culture what is their tradition you don't need to necessarily look abroad for for ideas i mean i have nothing against looking abroad don't get me wrong i'm a very very international person both in my mind and in my habit and in my uh in my uh, sort of outlook uh, but uh, you know it's it's uh, uh, the, uh, you, you know there's a saying in hindi bachcha bagal mein shahar bhar ghandora so you hear people quoting you know this in the iliad they do this and you know machiavelli says that all of which is great and you have right next to you to my mind the greatest story ever told so i felt look the people in india must uh, must understand the value of their own traditions and heritage and draw on them because today uh, you know we don't want to imitate other people i mean it is time for us to be us and for us to be us we must uh, as i say our lexicon our heritage our tradition our thought process so you know this uh, the term today we use uh, in in uh, uh, in governance politics and society atmanirbhar bharat well, when you say atmanirbhar it is not it is not a, a economic term it is at the end of the day a thought process so this was my expression shall i say or my experiment with that atmanirbharta and that book. No, you've got your mic switched off. Yeah, in in the book uh, Krishna's Choice, Doctor Jay Shankar, which is, uh, you know, you talk about the world seeking conformity with the rules and promotes observance of norms. At the same time, you say retaining the high moral ground is in many ways the ultimate test of real politic. and then you also say there's a broad correlation between occupying high moral ground and shaping the narrative so uh, you know in the in that way is the high moral ground primarily responsible for shaping the narrative or is there any other way for india no no i look uh, again uh, because the mahabharat is indian and i am an indian writing this book primarily for indians uh, what you say, you know you, you, your question is it for india is a reasonable question but it doesn't have to be for india i mean a lot of the lessons of mahabharat can apply to other countries uh, as well certainly the the proposition that you know say the point one of the points i make is uh, you know i'm i'm not i'm not naive okay i wouldn't have survived in my profession if i was i'm not hypocritical 
I'm not saying stuff which you say, I mean, come on, don't be, it can't be serious. I actually make a morality point in realism that you should be good, you should be right, you should be perceived to be good, to be moral, because in the real world, that's, that actually helps you. You know, uh, I mean, if you were a company, you would surely like to be known, you are a company. Uh, you would surely like to be known as a, you know, look, okay, these are the Sargankars, okay, they stand for something. When you do business with them, it means something. As you say, my word is as good a bond. So that, that kind of reputation, branding, standing, that, that is what a lot of really politics, both domestic politics, personal politics, and international politics is about. That you would finally say, you know, this person or this country, I trust them. You know, if he says so, that is so. You know. And why I say that is a lot of other traditions and accounts of politics, they focus a lot on outcomes. And basically how you kind of play around with the rules and take shortcuts and deceive and, uh, you know, uh, there is a premium put on deception. Okay. You know, you are smart because you fool the others. Now, my point is, okay, that works up to a point. But if you become a serial, uh, shall I say, a de de deviator, uh, from from the norms and rules. At some stage, people are going to figure it out. So I would say, I mean, the, the point I make about the, the uh, Pandavas is look, they spend their whole life building brand. At the end of the day, finally, it's not like they didn't do bad things or they didn't do things which were not ethically or uh, conventionally or morally uh, uh, correct. I mean, they did, and I've listed out uh, many of them, you know. But if you see, uh, you know, the, whether it was the killing of Dronacharya or whether it was the killing of uh, Karna, uh, Dronacharya was, you know, uh, killed when he had put down his weapons. Uh, Bhishma was killed by putting a woman up front uh, so that knowing that he wouldn't shoot back. Uh, Karna was killed by digging out uh, a chariot wheel from the ground. Uh, so it's not that they didn't do this. They did it in extremis. And at the end of the day, I mean, even Duryodhan was killed in a, in a, you know, by being hit below the belt. But at the end of the day, because the record was good, they, they were seen as the more ethical party the deviations, people said, okay, well, look, sometimes, uh, you know, people do these things. Whereas if you actually make that a practice, you don't get that latitude. The world will not uh, give you the same degree of understanding. So that's why I say, you know, being, uh, being morally good, ethically good, definitely has its uh, own value, but it's also the smarter way of doing politics. Uh, and I do think today in international relations, in today's international relations, uh, I think if you, if you build a reputation as a helpful country, uh, you know, as someone who will uh, stand up for others, uh, who, will, who will go out of their way, you know, who, and who if they say will do something, will do something. So, I, I do think those those uh, matter. So when we conduct foreign policy today, I mean, right now, for example, uh, we're all going through COVID and vaccines. I, I think for a country like us to say, okay, look, I'm vaccinating my people, but I'll also help others who may not have access to vaccines. Uh, I, I, I think it's good. It's also smart. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Jaishankar. Very interesting. Uh, Another question is, we are, uh, we are witnessing a return to history, then an end to it. You know, nationalism is on the rise world over. 
uh, first taking, I mean, I don't know, Mahabharata or otherwise, do you believe that a nationalistic foreign policy outlook is likely to approach the world with more confidence and greater realism? Uh, you know, uh, I think India is, is, is looked at so much better in the last five years uh, with the confidence and, and, you know, cooperation and and help India does, and you know, as a nation which others can trust. And does this is it because of our nationalism, or uh, uh, that gives us the confidence? Uh, what, 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 can you explain this to us? Uh, well, look. Uh, first of all, let me make the point which I have in the book too: that nationalism means different things to different people and to different regions. Okay, it's it doesn't have a uh, universal flat application. Uh, if you if you go say use the word in Europe, okay, or to some degree perhaps even in Japan, it doesn't really, it doesn't have a good resonance because it is associated with a very difficult time, a very bloody time, a very conflictual time era of their history. Okay. So there would be geographies and societies where actually uh, nationalism is looked at with a, with a certain amount of uh, suspicion or wariness. Okay. Then there would be uh, societies which, uh, which are global in their reach and influence. There actually nationalism would mean a kind of contraction. Okay, so if you look at the United States, I mean the United States in the history of the world is the most global power ever. Okay. So when you speak about nationalism in America, that means like you are pulling back. So uh, President Trump was more nationalistic than say President Obama or President Biden. Okay, so it has a different connotation because there it becomes nationalism, internationalism, globalism versus uh, more fortress America kind of. Uh, uh, in there would be societies where you know nationalism, in a sense, becomes like a mobilization uh, uh, message, if you would. Uh, so uh, it it would be seen as uh, you know uh, uh, very much very much the reaction uh, of a regime or a, or a, a system which is, which is uh, either asserting itself or defending itself or battling against odds to kind of keep its profile up. Uh, so you, you have that and sometimes people do associate it with uh, countries which have been empires. I mean, so there is talk of say Russian nationalism or Turkish nationalism or Iranian nationalism. Now, the problem is the European narrative, or broadly the Western narrative, the American narrative, the empire narrative, they tend to be the dominant narratives. So, if you, if you speak across the world, the overall sense is the word nationalism in many conversations doesn't have a nice ring to it. But now, I want to give you a different view. If you were to look in Asia, large parts of Asia, large parts of Africa, large parts of Latin America. What is nationalism? Nationalism was our regaining independence from foreign rule. Okay. It was our rebuilding our society after they were pillaged and uh, practically destroyed by, by foreigners. So if you ask somebody in India, are you nationalist? Say, of course I'm nationalist. Because, you know, after all, what do we say? Mahatma Gandhi led the national movement. Okay. We speak, you know, for us, nationalism is a positive force. It is regaining something. It is rediscovering your identity. It is, it is an expression of, of national, of, of confidence of a society, of the ambitions of a society. And to a large extent, it would apply to, uh, to pretty much other societies analogous to us who, who had their own versions of freedom movement and their own struggles against imperialism. So I would actually suggest to you that the word nationalism has almost like, you know, 
uh, a line bisecting it. So the global north treats it as a not as a positive word. The global south, I think, has a very different connotation uh, to it. So uh, in our case, uh, I I think uh, definitely. I mean, uh, when you uh, say I'm nationalistic or somebody is more nationalistic, it means you have a stronger uh, sort of passion for your country, for your society, uh, for uh, your higher ambitions. You are willing to do more uh, to to achieve your goals. So I I see it in our in in our own context as a very very uh, positive. Uh, yeah. Now in the world today, a uh, lot. <clears throat> what is going on is very interesting. On the one hand, and and my book explores this. Okay, there is what I call rebalancing. Okay, rebalancing means if you take the world and say, okay, who are the top twenty countries or top thirty countries? The top twenty thirty countries of nineteen forty five, of nineteen sixty five, of nineteen eighty five, and two thousand twenty are very different. Okay. And you are finding an India, a China, an Indonesia, a Vietnam, uh, a Brazil, a Chile. Now move up the ladder, Mexico, etc. Uh, so uh, the uh, as they move up the ladder, you know, uh, the initially a lot of this was economic. You know, uh, so you you saw uh, you know in East Asia, in Southeast Asia. Uh, primarily, we saw it as an economic phenomenon. As it gathered more and more momentum, economic rebalancing uh, became political rebalance. So, uh, countries which you know went up the ladder became the major economies. Naturally, wanted to uh, assert their political uh, interests and influence as well. And the most notable, of course, was China. But the the, the domain which we are now entering. And I sort of touched on it in a way that Krishna, the Mahabharata chapter, is an expression of it. Is that if the there is a different a difference in our economic weightage, and now a difference in our political weightage, how long will it take before there's a difference in our cultural weightage? Would you know why should I necessarily dress, eat, talk, think? Like the dominant uh, powers of the earlier era, because now if I am pulling my own weight, I count for more. I will also say, well, you know, this is how I think. These are my expressions. Uh, this is the way I would like the world to run. So there will be there will be a, a sort of a uh, I would say a new equilibrium uh, among the major uh, cultural and intellectual. Uh, Sort of uh, streams of the world, and I think that has uh, begun begun to happen. So, you know, uh, uh, when when you get into this debate, and and again, I I would add this point that the old order, you know, the the see the old order was very much what they told you was a globalized order, but. The globalized made it out as though everybody had a fair stake in it, which was not true. So the globalization was for the benefit of some, some within societies and some among certain countries. Now that globalized order has been challenged. It has been challenged by the economic rebalancing, the political rebalancing, and now the cultural rebalance. So you will have you will have a long period. Where there will be very intense argumentation uh, about countries, about political forces, about leaders, uh, there will be you know the old order would try to, I would say, uh, show the challengers in a way, in not necessarily in a good light. You know, they would attribute to the challengers you know beliefs and practices and try to make them look again. I go back to that. As though they are away from the norm, you know. Because the norm, the old order will still say we define the norm. You know, we tell you what is right. You know, which kind of nationalism is right. You know, which kind of law is right. Which kind of practice is right. So there will be. I mean, 
you know, life is full of double standards. So a lot of this would, would uh, express itself in that. These are going to be the active conversations uh, which, which we are going to have. So you will have situations where, you know, country A or country B will do something. When they do it, it's perfectly all right. If country X or Y does the same thing or similar thing, it's not all right. So these will be the tussles which will, which will happen. And they will happen, you know, across different domains. Well, thank you. Uh, where, where will we be in the global order, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar? Will India define itself or will the world define India? Look, I think we, we, uh, we are in a, in a kind of a twilight zone. Okay. It was natural that we were more defined by the world 70 years ago. Okay. After all, we had been colonized for a long time. Yes, we had, under uh, Mahatma Gandhi's leadership, asserted ourselves. But we still had to make a lot of compromises uh, in the 40s and 50s. And it, it also, the, the more, you know, it wasn't so much, these were not transactional compromises. Very often your mindset uh, was, was uh, influenced by, by what you grew up. I mean, if people were educated in, in the UK, Okay, they had a certain mindset, you know. They may have had, they could have been nationalistic, definitely. They wanted the best for their country. But the fact is, if they were educated there and this was their comfort zone and this was their thought process, uh, they, you know, uh, a lot of that they would have carried back even as they built their own uh, nationalistic uh, framework. Now, with the passage of time, what has happened, you know, I regard it actually as a tremendous proof of the success of our democracy. That from a relatively more elitist uh, leadership, you know, over a period of time, democracy actually has struck roots. I mean, uh, after all, think about it, when the British left India, uh, I think less than 10% of our population was literate. Okay, I think 8% of my memory served me right, give or take. Now, today it is eight times that number, 10 times that number. So, uh, in fact, our idea of what is literate itself has changed. Now, if you look today at, you know, in any domain, you know, it could be in politics, it could even be in cricket. You look, you will see more people coming in from small towns, from rural backgrounds, more self-made people, more people who are much more comfortable with their mother tongue. I, I regard this as, as actually a proof that over 70 years, the, the democratic, uh, you know, uh, experiment or whatever you call practices have struck deep roots. They have brought about a change and in fact, I, I think somewhere in my uh, book, I used this phrase that this is an India that is more Bharat. And so we will go through this as well. In fact, I would say, I would even go be bold enough to assert that we will be one of the major players in this. Because uh, think about it. in by the end of this decade, okay, which isn't that far away, we will definitely be the most populous country we will almost certainly be the third largest economy even in nominal terms. You will see more, I mean, already if you look back last few decades, you can see us globalizing. I mean, you have today about uh, 30, 33, 34 million Indians, NRIs and PIOs around the world. As the world moves towards a much more sort of knowledge-based human resources driven economy and activities. I mean, we, we are the largest pool of available human resources for the world. So I, you know, when I look, look at our future, I actually see a much bigger uh, sort of uh, uh, influence that we will have in the world. And it, this may not, it doesn't have to be a government strategy. Okay, it would be good if it's a government strategy. 
it will happen on its own you know today if there are uh, you know 3 and 1/2 million indian americans and i don't know maybe another million 2 million uh, non citizens living out there this was not something which somebody planned it happened i mean the economy did it technology did it migration did it movement of people did it aspiration did it so i i do see an india which has an immense sort of uh, role ahead of it uh, in the next decade but if that india is much more confident if that india is much more aware of its interest uh, that india is stronger it has deeper strengths uh, so i would say to me preparing for that era because that time is coming you know the time is not now the time still will take it will take time you know some some years ago i used the word saying leading power now people some people misunderstood it and seemed to suggest that i thought we were a leading power i think our goal is to be a leading but you can't be a leading power leaving it to god and gravity you have to work to be a leading power thank you you touched upon the current modi administration uh, uh, about atmanirbhar bharat and uh, does this uh, sabka saath sabka vikas uh, sabka vishwas approach uh, uh, as relevant to foreign policy as it is to domestic uh, policy i mean you you mentioned the vaccine also and the growth of india and you know the help we give so uh, how do you manage the optics of this uh, both diplomatically Uh, and successfully look uh, uh i i mean it's been this is it's been now 7 years of the modi government of which i saw the first lot as a as a diplomat and civil servant i've seen the last two years as a minister of the government uh i think in the most sort of sweeping way i can say you actually are seeing a revolution in the making because you actually seeing an inclusive fairer society being built with much greater strengths and capabilities and in a sense uh, you know the covid the the covid experience actually uh, it 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 showed us perhaps to our own surprise here are being the entire country Uh, how much we have progressed uh, in the last five or six years? That if the you know the very fact that during this COVID period that we could put in money into the bank accounts of four hundred million people, okay, that's larger than the size of Europe or United States. That we could feed eight hundred million people during this period by giving them you know uh, food. Uh, the this would not have happened seven years ago eight years ago uh, i mean you know what a leakage culture there was at that point i mean and and the uh, most uh, uh, graphic statement on leakages was actually said by rajiv gandhi during his prime ministership that you know what a small percentage eventually reaches the beneficiary so the the point i am making is see we are we have also raised the levels of our ambition and the beauty of this is every time you raise the level and you achieve it you you know it's important never to be satisfied but there was a time when we would have said you know giving everybody power would be fantastic unbelievable giving everybody water oh out of the world today i mean people think I mean, come on, speed it up, get it, get it done with, move on with it. So, actually, what were impossible yardsticks has actually, you know, the the uh, prime minister has actually made it seem achievable. I mean, we have it is within our the realm of doability to see every household connected to water, everybody connected to power. to see a day in the not distant future where actually everybody has a roof over their heads the idea i mean can you even imagine the idea 10 years ago of health coverage 
Yet, you look at the speed at which Ayushman Bharat is moving. You look at the digital connectivity. So, uh, the, the point I'm making is, you know, in one way, I'm amazed at what we are doing at home. In one way, I'm very glad that I'm, you know, I, I'm uh, normalizing every achievement and then aiming for the next level. Now, why I'm saying that to you is, if we are doing that, we have realized the importance of carrying everybody with us, of, of an inclusive society, of, a, of greater strengths, of broader constituency. For a country like India, you know, with all the, uh, you know, with the multiple heritages and all the advantages that we have, it's important we do, we do that abroad as well. I am a natural coalition builder. Okay, I am an English-speaking country. I am a democracy. I am a country of the South. You know, I am post-colonial. So, I have so many constituencies with which I can actually. Uh, sort of uh, build bonds and, and find commonalities. I mean, you know, uh, somebody once told me that Indians have this extraordinary ability to actually handle multiple identities. I mean, you know, if I ask you, what are you or who are you? Your answer will depend on who's asking. And only you and I will know that question and how to reply to that question. In a way, that is happening to us with the world as well. That, you know, the democracies naturally see me as a democracy. The English-speaking world does so. The, you know, the, my fellow, you know, the countries with whom there's a deep solidarity from the uh, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist struggle, see me as a fellow uh, struggler of that. So, uh, I, I would say, uh, for me, the Sapka Saat, Sapka Vikas, and Sapka Vishwas is actually my driving principle of the public policy. I mean, that is why I do vaccine mastery. That is why I do this, you know, if there's a disaster in the region, I help out. That is why today, uh, if you look, whether it's my solar initiative or my disaster resilient initiative, these are all expressions of Can we go in for last two questions, Dr. Jai Shankar? Or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just want to change track and ask you about. I, I'm I'm told you love cricket, and uh, this is something I would like to uh, ask you. Uh, how similar is foreign policy planning with the planning of a, a cricket test match? Because you know the conditions change. Uh, we are playing different countries, different pitches. You know, you plan a spin bowling attack. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, all sorts of things happen and, you know, you have to change tact. So, uh, uh, do you apply your cricket knowledge to foreign policy or your foreign policy to your cricketing? Well, look, uh, I'm, I'm uh, deeply interested. I follow it with a great deal of passion. By the way, it was a great match yesterday. I don't know if you saw it. Yes, yes, you yes. Know, I mean, the last over was really nailed by me. And uh, if I get reincarnated, I'd like to be reincarnated as Ravi Shastri's assistant. Uh, so that, you know, I'm at least a fly on the wall when they are uh, strategizing. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, and, and uh, I think many, those who work with me know, I very often unconsciously slip into cricket analogies uh, in telling people what to do which is a problem, by the way, for those who don't share that uh, interest. So sometimes I have to check uh, myself as well. But, you know, it's, to me, it's a very interesting uh, analogy because uh, somewhere, and this is not a cricket point, it's a sports point. Sports have an enormous, uh, shall I say, ability to instill national confidence. I mean, I've seen in different countries, okay, I mean, at difficult times, people find strength, solace, inspiration in sports. Okay. It's a great binding force uh, for people. Because there's so many, you know, because at the end of the day, what is common? You know, sports is very common. At the end of the day, it is about competition. You know, and strategizing for competition. 
So, I mean, exactly what you say, you know, I mean, you tell some, you know, a lot of, and uh, I, I once had uh, some weeks ago, I think this was when we were still in, our team was in Australia. I was doing an Australian event. And the Australian and a friend of mine and I agreed, we said, we'll do a book next time of international relations and, and cricket, how the two, two correlate. But look at these years, look at these years of India. And look at these years of India. You know, if if I were to say the evolution of Indian cricket, I'm not now talking of individual players and so on and the great players. I'm not talking management strategy, messaging, you know, the, the big picture. See the, the kind of change which a Ganguly made, attitude wise, vis a vis the world. Okay. Then the kind of Stratagems and thinking and planning and bo boldness that Adhoni brought. I mean, uh, the the I mean, keeping cool in extreme under extreme pressure, making very bold. You know the Joginder Sharma decision. Or look at today the the kind of uh, effort which Virat Kohli symbolizes the fitness. The so. You know, sports has evolved in this country. And I would surely like to see a lot of that happen in other sports. You know, I, 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 I'm I very happy. You know, I once uh, had, when I was with the Tatas, listened to, uh, a, you know, a great discussion with Palela Gopicha. Uh, how badminton got built up in this country. And and you see today, I mean, look, look how we are doing at badminton. And I'm very convinced when I look at the history of sports, and see countries who have done that. I mean, I would like to see that not just happen in cricket, even though that is my passion. I would like to see it happen in uh, in uh, in other sports uh, as well. And that evolution which I see in cricket, I also see in foreign policy or in the country. In a way, that we are today much more confident. We will, you know, we we don't buckle down. We are willing to take the tough tough decisions. We hold our nerve. We prepare much more diligently than we did before. Now, everything I said, you could apply to cricket as well. Very true. Very true. Uh, my last question, which we all, always ask everybody, what are your five personal mantras, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar? Uh, for all the young generation, you know, you're a, a role model for many. Uh, so what, what are the five personal mantras you could share with us? Well, uh, I haven't quite thought about it that way, uh, but uh, I think one I told you, which is if you if you actually make a, a profession or a, a practice of what deeply interests you, you you really do so much better at it because it's not an effort. I mean, you have to enjoy what you are doing. So there are two ways of doing it, which is Either you go and pick, figure out what you enjoy and pick that as a, as a life uh, style or a profession. Or if you've got one, then you figure out ways of enjoying it. Uh, I, would, I mean, to me, the, uh, you know, uh, one of the interesting things about uh, being a diplomat is we would typically go to a new country every three years. Okay. So you arrive in a country very often, I mean, it's unlikely you will speak the language of every country, probably about 20, 30 percent you would, but most of them you would. So you kind of parachute into a place. Nowadays, at least we travel more. So you may have been there earlier in the days when I started, you know, I, I never went abroad till I joined the foreign service. So the idea of knowing a country before going there didn't arise. So you arrive in a country and then you have a, a short period because after you've been about a month or so, the next person who comes from India, from the government or business or whatever, they actually think you are the guy who's there. So you must know everything about the place. Okay. So this is learning. Okay. You, I mean, so you parachute in a place and bang, I mean, you start figuring out how does it work and how does that place work? So that you expect, you know, 
in a month or two or three, you will be asked to deliver on what needs to be delivered. So, in an interesting way, I think with the passage of time, I found we have all, in the, at least in the diplomatic profession, we've become very nimble. We've also become very self-sufficient, okay? Because there's no external, you know, if you're in a government uh, office here in India, there's a, there's a whole support system. The embassies are typically very, very small. So you're pretty much on your own with a small group. So I realized the virtues of self-sufficiency and nimbleness. I mean, I often found, on a, I'm, I'm not, I mean, don't take this as a mic. I'm, I don't try to do everything myself. But what others don't need to do for me, I would rather they don't. I would, I would much rather get, I mean, I still do a lot of my WhatsApp and emails and, uh, you know, I, I, I'd rather write my own speeches, do my own emails, answer my own WhatsApps. It's a, it's a, and, and it keeps you, it keeps you nimble. And when you do that, I would say a big discovery as you get older, which everybody will, uh, is the willingness to, learn. you know, every day is a learning. Every, every day is a learning provided you want to learn. Because the day you think, okay, I've arrived, so, you know, you, I mean, you never say that explicitly to yourself, but if that's your, your brain attitude, whereas it still is, oh, there's this person who, you know, I wonder how they do this, you know. Uh, or, or if you are curious, if you are uh, sort of there's that desire to uh, so at the end of the day it's a kind of a competitive spirit that you know because you are 65 you don't want somebody in 25 to be smarter than you and know something which you don't know so you actually tried one part of you wants to be 25 as well so I, I would say rather than five mantras I give you only one which is be competitive you know if all the while it's in your mind to be competitive to me, that's nirvana. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jai Shankar. Uh, one last question: uh, What does Goa mean to you personally? I mean, uh, since we are based in Goa, uh, any 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 uh, attraction to Goa for you, or what does Goa mean to you personally? How, how can people not be attracted to Goa? You know, uh, so uh, again. Uh, I, I, I think I will now amend that. I said if I'm reincarnated, it will be as Ravi Shastri's assistant. I will be Ravi Shastri's assistant living in Goa. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, I'm a Delhi wala. I mean, for me, you have everything I don't have. So, most of all, Goa for me means envy. Thank I you. envy you guys every day. Thank you, Dr. Jai Shankar, so much for your genius, your brilliance, and for sharing your valuable time with us. We are most privileged. And it's an honor to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much from the bottom of our hearts. God bless you and God bless India. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.